Yanda Chimit Bhagavatam Ki. Go Rapimanani. Maybe you can just give me the lid on top and I use that as a table, if that's okay. Yes, like that. Perfect. Om Agyanti Mandasya Agyananjala Shalakya Chakshun Militam Dena Tasmai Shri Gavinama Shri Chaitanya Manupistam Sabinam Yenabhutale Svayam Upakaram Ayam Danati Svabhanatikam Namam Vishnabhada Kishabhisa Bhutale Shimate Bhaktivedanta Svaminiti Namane Namaste Sasvani Neve Govani Pachai Neve Vishisha Shunivari Pachata Deshata Arine Vanchakapa Tubisha Kripas in Vavacha Padita Nampava Nebu Vaishnavibu Namunama Jai Shri Krishna Tetanya Babu Nityananda Shri Advaita Garada Shri Vasadi Go Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya So we're reading from Kento 3, chapter 20, verse 10, 11, and 12, since 10 and 11 have no purport. All right? Yes. Ye marichyada yu vipra Ye marichyada yu vipra Yastu svayam buvu manuhu Yastu svayam buvu manuhu Te vaiba mana adeshat Shivai Brahmana Adishad Katamitat Abhavayan Katamitat Abhavayan Yimari Chyada Yuvipra Yastu Svayam Bhuvu Manuhu Te vaiba mana adishat Katamitat abhavayan Ladies. Yeah, those. Marichi Adia. Great sages headed by Marichi. Vipra, Brahmanas, 
Ja, hu, tu, indeed, Swayambhuva Manu, and Swayambhuva Manu, te, they, vai, indeed, Brahmana, of Lord Brahma, Adishad, by the order, Katam, how, etat, this universe, Abhavayan, evolved, translation by Shlok Prabhupada. Vidura inquired, how did the Pachapadis, such progenitors of living entities as Marichi and Swayambhuv Manu, create according to the instruction of Brahma? And how did they evolve this manifested universe? Text 11. Did they evolve the creation in conjunction with their respective wives? Did they remain independent in their action? Or did they all jointly produce it? Verse number 12. Maitreya said, when the equilibrium of the combination of the three modes of nature was agitated by the unseen activity of the living entity, by Mahavishnu and by the force of time, the total material elements were produced. Purport by Shilaprabhat. The cause of the material creation is described here very lucidly. The first cause is daiva, or the destiny of the conditioned soul. The material creation exists for the conditioned soul who wanted to become a false lord for in sense enjoyment. One cannot trace out the history of when the conditioned soul first desired to lord it over material nature. But in Vedic literature, we always find that the material creation is meant for the sense enjoyment of the conditioned soul. There is a nice verse which says, that the sum and substance of the conditioned soul's sense enjoyment is that as soon as he forgets his primary duty to render service to the Lord, he creates an atmosphere of sense enjoyment, which is called maya. That is the cause of material creation. Another word used here is dovitakena. No one can argue about when and how the conditioned soul became desirous of sense enjoyment. But the cause is there. Material nature is an atmosphere meant only for the sense enjoyment of the conditioned soul. And it is created by the personality of Godhead. It is mentioned here that in the beginning of the creation, the material nature or Prakriti is agitated by the personality of Godhead, Vishnu. There are three Vishnus mentioned. One is Maha Vishnu, another is Gavadaksha Vishnu, and the third is Chiyodaksha Vishnu. The first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam discusses all these three Vishnus, and there is also, and here also it is confirmed that Vishnu is the cause of creation. From Bhagavad Gita also we learn that Prakriti begins to work and is still working under Krishna's or Vishnu's glance of superintendence. But the Supreme Personality of Godhead is unchangeable. One should not mistakenly think that because the creation emanates from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he has therefore transformed in, into this material cosmic manifestation. He exists in his personal form always, but the cosmic manifestation takes place by his inconceivable potency. The workings of that energy are difficult to comprehend, but it is understood from Vedic literature that the conditioned soul creates his own destiny and is offered a particular body by the laws of nature under the superintendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who always accompanies him as Paramatma. So, quite a complex purport. 
let us remember that Krishna he is actually the only personality who has no duties to perform. Right? He is God. He just can play with his cowherd friends, with the cows, the calves, and with the gopis, and, and, and. So he is the only personality who doesn't have any duties. Right? So, and in order to perform all these aspects of creation, there is Vishnu there, you know, the three forms of Vishnu, Kshiyodaksha Vishnu, Gavadaksha Vishnu, Karanadaksha Vishnu. So they perform all these duties, you know, Karanadaksha Vishnu, he lies on the on the cause of ocean and from him come all the universes. So then we have Gavadaksha Vishnu, he expands himself into each and every universe. From him comes the lotus flower there from his navel. So then Lord Brahma appears. And then the uh, Kshirodaksha Vishnu is in every living entity's heart as super soul, accompanying every living entity, witnessing you know, what, they, what actions and desire, what actions they perform, what what desires they have. And also here in the purport, Prabhupada makes the same point like we had a couple of days ago, that even though Krishna is the source of all this material creation, it doesn't mean that he becomes a part of it. You know? Now, that's what the Mayavadis think, and, and, and we discussed it a few days ago. And Prabhupada often gives the example of the, you know, the chief of a prison, just because he also is there in the prison and uh, supervising everything. It doesn't mean he's part of the prison. <laughs> so he's not a prisoner. He's there, but it doesn't mean that he's under the laws of the prison. You know? So in the same way, Krishna is always, you know, above and beyond um, all the facets of material energy and creation and so on, even though it all emanates from him, you know. And, yeah, and Prabhupada also says very nicely, you know, um, we cannot trace back when the living entity had this desire to enjoy separately, you know. There's, there's always this famous question, so how is it that the spirit soul falls down from the spiritual world and then? And, and because we think um, once we are in the spiritual world, we will not fall down, so how is it, you know, that question very often comes up, you know. So, and Prabhupada actually gives here the answer, you know, we, we cannot trace back. But it all starts with this subtle, tiny little thought, or oh, I wonder what it would be like to be in Krishna's place and enjoy like he is doing. You know, it's very subtle. So as soon as the living entity comes up with this thought, Immediately, boom, back here in the material world, you know, because spiritual world, there is no room for any kind of desire for sense enjoyment. There's so many quotes where Prabhupada describes that. Spiritual world is devoid of sense gratification. That's why there's also no envy, because the living entities get so much pleasure of, you know, making all the pleasing arrangements for the Lord and be enjoyed by the Lord, that sense gratification is a boring waste of time. There is no room for this. But yet, somehow, for some souls, you know, that thought comes. And just to make sure the spiritual world remains pure, you know, as soon as there's some slight trace of that thought coming up, immediately the soul has to leave and come to the material world. 
And as Prabhupada so nicely describes, this is the purpose of the material world. It actually, in one sense, it is, in one sense, it is desired. It is created by the conditioned soul because just to fulfill their desire to enjoy, Krishna creates it. Right? So if the souls would not have that desire, then there would not be any need for a material world. So it is simply, you know, the response to that minute independence of the conditioned soul to either, you know, serve the Lord and, and enjoy that constitutional position of being enjoyed by the Lord or to somehow try and be in forgetfulness of the Lord. So that, that independence Krishna has to give the conditioned soul just to make sure um, there is pure love because love cannot be forced. You know? So that's why the Lord always gives us that choice. That's that minute independence Krishna is giving us at any time. Every day, you know, we have that minute independence. And sometimes we see that devotees, after so many years, you know, of uh, practicing Krishna consciousness or attempting to practice Krishna consciousness, so then they leave. So this happens, you know. Prabhupada always said, don't be surprised who leaves, but be surprised who stays. So that minute independence we have, always. Even in the spiritual world, seems like it, you know. So, and only then, if that independence is given, then there can be true love, you know, because love cannot be forced and it has to be voluntarily given, you know, like that. So, I mean, understanding, you know, how Krishna creates this whole show here we can almost compare to a really amazing uh, game, you know, like these days people get so much pleasure of playing computer games. But Krishna's game here, this is really uh, beyond any kind of computer game <laughs> that people came up with, you know. <laughs> to, yeah, just the way... It is all set up, it's really quite extraordinary and amazing, you know, that all the souls are buzzing around here in the material world, trying to find their happiness in this lifetime, that lifetime. And then sometimes they make some little progress, but oh, still they don't make it back, you know, okay, another life, and, and, and. You know, and then, oh, finally, a few souls make it back, you know, to the spiritual world. You know, so it's quite amazing. And if it wasn't for the super soul, you know, being present in every living entity's heart, well, then the whole game wouldn't really work so well, you know, because in that way, Krishna is keeping that contact, that connection. You know, yes, by the super soul patiently waiting, you know, when when is the living entity finally ready uh, to turn towards me and, 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 you know. There's, there's a nice verse in the 11th, no, actually it's in the purport, 11th canto, 11th chapter, verse 6. It says there, Lord Krishna is so kind that he patiently sits in the heart trying to guide the conditioned soul back home, back to Godhead. Certainly no material friend would remain with such foolish companion for millions of years, especially if, he is, if his companion were to ignore him or even curse him. That's what we do with Krishna, you know. But Lord Krishna is such a faithful, loving friend that he accompanies even the most demoniac living entity and is also in the heart of the insect, pig, and dog. <laughs> so very nicely, you know, explains the situation actually. 
you know, that we may have so many friends here in the material world, but usually if we ignore them and kick them in the face once, two times, three times, they usually give up, give up on us. Right? But Krishna never gives up on us, you know. He just patiently waits and, and, and. Even though it is also described how Krishna actually, it is painful for him when he sees how the living entities get themselves into trouble again and again and again. You know, very similar to what a parent experiences when the child is getting themselves into trouble, doing all kinds of nonsense, especially when the child is older than 16, then the parents cannot discipline anymore. So it's very disheartening, very painful for the parents to see, oh my God, don't do that, you know, it just will create your misery. But they have to give that independence also, just like Krishna gives us that independence, you know. Good to remember. You know, so Krishna also allows us, you know, because sometimes people ask when we preach, people ask, so why is, why is God allowing all this suffering to go on? You know, well, that's why, because he can't force us. He doesn't want to force us because love has to be voluntary. So, but it certainly pains him, you know, to see how the conditioned soul is getting themselves lifetime after lifetime into misery. And there's one purport where Prabhupada says, actually that's why a preacher performs very personal service to the Lord. He relieves him of this pain. And he says, my dear Lord, don't worry. I will try to, you know, uh, reclaim these conditioned salts and bring them back to you. You know, to increase your pleasure and to relieve you from the suffering. So therefore, preaching can be seen as a very personal service to the Lord, relieving him from the, his pain. You know, nice way, different way of seeing um, the service of a preacher, you know. Yeah, so, but that's the situation. Krishna never gives up on us. He patiently waits you know, and, and tries to take every opportunity to remind us, hey, you know, let go of this nonsense, turn back to me. I'm here waiting for you. You're not meant to be here in this material world. You know, so the Lord is trying every opportunity to, you know, to remind us of this and simply patiently witnesses and okay, if you want to do that nonsense, so then you have to get some suffering here. And, 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 you know. Yeah, so no friend in this material world would be so faithful and patient and never give up on us, you know. So that's why Krishna is really, um, yeah, our, our most you know, intimate and faithful, loving friend. Of course, Guru Prabhupada, we can also say they also imbibe this mood, you know, of not so easily rejecting a disciple or something. And even if he rejects, then it is also for his own good, actually, to give him a chance to come to his senses or something. But, you know, as a rule, you know, Guru, Sadhu, they also have that mood of, of compassion, no matter how, how ill a disciple treats him and kicks him in the face like a parent. You know, the child also kicks the mother and uh, she will not take offense or anything, you know. So in the same way, um, Guru and, and Sadhu also have this, this mood, you know. Yeah, so in this way, Prabhupada gives this nice example of the material world being like a nonsensical stage performance, you know, which I find a very adequate description. Nonsensical stage performance. It's one of my favorites, you know, <laughs> because that's really what it is like. Every lifetime is like a performance on the stage, and we get a certain body, you know, 
and we play certain roles and we really take it in, we really identify with it. Oh, I'm so busy, I'm a German woman with so many duties and important things to do and oh, I'm so busy, 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 running, running, running. So, and then death comes, curtain is closing, show is over, it's all finished. And then comes the next nonsensical stage performance, the next life, maybe in a man's body in India or something, and same thing happens, oh, I'm so busy, I've got so many important things to do, no time for Krishna, no, no, so many important things. Running, 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 and then, dum 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 curtain closes, show is over. You know, so like that, it goes lifetime after lifetime, and Paramatma in the heart simply patiently accompanies the living entity through this nonsensical stage performance, you know. Until then, finally, 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 by some good fortune, you know, the living entity comes to the point where he gets sick and tired of the whole nonsensical stage performance, you know. <laughs> What's the verse? Pramanda Bhamite Kona Bhagavan Jeev Ku Krishna Prashadi Pai Bhakti Lata Breed. So after you know traveling through all the different universes up and down and all different um, species of life, one may have the good fortune to meet a devotee, a sadhu, you know, and get some knowledge. And there is a nice a row of verses in the Prima Rivata, which I often like to discuss. It very nicely describes the the inner attitude and condition of the soul, you know. This is Prima Rivata, verse 7. Roaming about in the material world, taking one life after another, if by chance the living entity comes in contact with a saintly person, he becomes immediately knowledgeable of his true identity as pure spirit soul and eternal servant of the Lord. So, roaming about, that's what we really do, roaming. <laughs> you know, and then by some good fortune, by some chance, well, we can say it's not really by chance, you know, because as we know from Queen Kunti, you know, she tells us that actually one has to be materially exhausted. Yes, this material exhaustion has to be there in the heart. That we come to the point, oh, I had enough. What is this? Is there something more than just eating, sleeping, mating, defending? You know, is there some higher purpose? I'm trying again and again to enjoy, but again and again I fall on my nose. So what is this all about? You know, that's kind of the material exhaustion that we just start to realize that I just can't make it really big here in the material world. And and enjoy and you know yeah that we are exhausted from all these attempts to materially enjoy so then then Paramatma witnesses that in the heart you know it's quite a mysterious process so Paramatma witnesses oh now now he starts thinking and wondering and now he's fed up with all his attempts to enjoy and become successful in the material world. So then the heart is ripe, you know, that the grounds are pre prepared in the heart for the seed, you know, for the bhakti lata to be sown. And we can, I mean, many devotees experience this also in their life, you know, that they actually came to a point where they were just frustrated and they were really unconsciously calling out in their heart, my God, is there anything else for life, you know? And then very often 
the person meets a book distributor or a Harinam party or get some little sweet ball or some kitchery or you know. Yes. That's why going on book distribution is such a transcendental affair actually, you know, because you're really out there capturing these souls who are at that point where they actually had enough, you know. And often you experience that, you know, you're not the doer, but you're just a puppet there in Krishna's plan. And the more pure our desire is to be an instrument in Krishna's plan, the more Krishna uses us, you know. Yes, yes, and all kinds of amazing stories we can experience, you know. Yeah, so this material exhaustion is quite important actually for really, that's why, you know, Queen Kunti says actually only when we are materially exhausted then we can really feelingly approach the Lord, you know. Even though, of course, we can also say, well, we have also the example of Dhruva Maharaj, you know, who was highly materially motivated in the beginning, wanting a huge kingdom there, you know. And, you know, with that material motivation, he, he wasn't really materially exhausted, actually, you know. But with that material motivation, he took the, the instructions of Narada Muni very seriously, completely, you know. So, and that actually purified him. You know, that helped him to give up ultimately that um, uh, material focus, you know, that focus on material success, you know. That through his sincere practice, as we probably also have some experience, if we sincerely practice, then Krishna reveals himself. He may not appear, you know, like like he did to uh, Dhruva Maharaj in that way. But yeah, we, we get some glimpses, you know, some revelations, some realizations Krishna gives. And then we get a higher taste, you know. And then, oh, I was just running after these uh, broken um, uh, glass uh, uh, things, you know, rather than for the real jewels, I was just running after the um, broken glass pieces there, you know. So, yeah, and then we give up the lower taste, you know. So, all right, in the beginning, we may still have that hope and ambition that we want to enjoy in this material world, but sooner or later, we have to get to the point, you know, where we um, feel materially exhausted. Yes, yes. We can't, we can't forever maintain the strong focus on material success. Then bhakti cannot really, you know, really grow strongly. You know, sooner or later we have to get to that point of getting a higher taste. And, you know, if we, if we really strictly follow the, you know, the instructions of Guru, of Prabhupada, strictly, you know, that, like, Dhruva Maharaj had his focus on spiritual life, you know, even though he had that motivation in the heart, but his focus was, Completely on his spiritual practice, completely. He was there in the forest. He didn't try and endeavor for some huge kingdom there by fighting or what, you know, with, you know, with his stepbrother there or something. No, no, he, he completely focused on his spiritual life. You know, even though he still had that material motivation. So, yeah. So that's why Queen Kundi tells us, um, yeah, only when we are materially exhausted can we actually approach Krishna with a sincere feeling. And there is one pretty heavy 
<clears throat> purport where Prabhupada even goes so far. I mean, he makes a very strong statement. Maybe I'll just quickly read that to you because it's always good to hear directly how Prabhupada says it. Yeah, this is 1826 chapter with Queen Kunti. Prabhupada says there, actually the Lord's holy name has such powerful potency, but there is a quality of such utterance also. It depends on the quality of feeling. A helpless man can feelingly utter the holy name of the Lord, whereas a man who utters the same holy name in great material satisfaction cannot be so sincere. Ooh, this is heavy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, aren't we all striving for great material satisfaction? If we're a little honest, I think we do, you know. Yes, so, and as long as we are, you know, um, rooted in material satisfaction, how can we feel helpless, you know? Material satisfaction means, no worries, mate. <laughs> you know, no, I'm doing all right, everything goes great, I've got my big house and my car and my job and this and that. Yeah, life is not too bad. She'll be right, mate. <laughs> so that's great material satisfaction. Not so easy to feel helpless and call out in, in the helplessness to Krishna, you know. So, and then Prabhupada goes on, even making a few more strong statements. He says, a materially puffed up person may utter the holy name of the Lord occasionally, but he is incapable of uttering the name in quality. Therefore, the four principles of material advancement, namely high parentage, good wealth, high education, and attractive beauty, are, so to speak, disqualifications for progress on the path of spiritual advancement. Serious, isn't it? Yes. So these four principles of material advancement, wealth, high education, aristocratic family, bodily beauty, they are so to speak disqualifications. So we have to be careful, you know. Why are they disqualifications? Because as a rule they lead to pride. That's the whole problem. You know, and then we think, oh, look at me, I'm so wealthy, I have such high education, and oh, you know, and I'm so great. And yeah, and then we can't chant in the mood of Trinada Pisunichina, you know, we recite the Shikshastikam every day, but often we don't so deeply understand it actually, you know, and we just say it, you know. Yeah, so good to remind ourselves every now and again that this material advancement, economic development, this is not success in life. Sooner or later we all have to keep it, leave it behind, you know? Yes, at the moment of death, no significance how big our house is or how, how high our education is and, 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 you know? Yes. That's why Shastra uh, recommends one should be satisfied with whatever is required to keep body and soul together, actually. And for that, not much is required, actually. I travel a lot in poor countries, I see. You don't need that much to keep body and soul together, you know. Yes. Let's go back to Prema Vivata. So, Roaming about in the material world, taking one birth after another. If by chance the living entity comes in contact with a saintly person, he becomes immediately knowledgeable of his true identity as pure spirit soul and eternal servant of the Lord. Of course, immediately knowledgeable. I wish it was so immediate. For us, it's not so immediate. It takes a bit of time, you know. But if if the heart is prepared, if there is material exhaustion, then that knowledge can really hit and take roots there. You know? 
Yes. Then it really sinks on the level of the heart. Then it's not just gyan in the head. Yes, yes, I know I'm Krishna servant, I know. But then we make so many uh, attempts to enjoy and control, you know. So then obviously we don't know. To know means to act on it, you know. Yes. Or Bhagavad Gita, knowledge means qualities, you know. So as long as it's just gyan, just book knowledge, you know, that it has to sink to the heart, it has to transform the heart, you know. And if that material exhaustion is there, then it will hit the heart. So then, let us continue. Enlightened by this knowledge, he does not want material entanglement any longer, and he laments. Alas, why have I served this illusory material energy for so long? So that should be the natural response, the emotion the living entity feels when that knowledge hits the heart. You know? So there we can already look in our, our own life and see, uh, do we feel some lamentation about all the nonsense we have done before, you know? And, and do we lament, oh my God, so many lifetimes I've just been uh, roaming around here. And also in this life, so many years, I've been ignoring Krishna, turning my back to him, trying to forget him. You know, do we lament about it or do we think, oh, actually I'm a pretty cool guy and I've done so many cool things and, and so on. You know, so then obviously that knowledge has not hit the heart yet. You know? And then next verse, he bitterly regrets and cries out, Krishna, my Lord, I'm your eternal servant. Ever since I left the shelter of your lotus feet, my life has been completely devastated. That should be the feeling, you know? Yes. So that actually shows, you know, if that knowledge of Sambanda Gyan, who am I, who is Krishna, who is, what is this whole material world all about, if that actually hits the heart, then very naturally when we chant the holy name, we can actually cry out, longing for the relationship. Right? Makes sense? Hmm? Yes, yes. Then it becomes very natural, you know. Lord Krishna is so merciful that if anyone appeals to him earnestly, he immediately releases the jiva from material entanglement. Wow. You know, it's a whole internal mysterious process actually. So Paramatma is there witnessing. So and then if we sincerely cry out to Krishna, he immediately gets into action there. Next verse. Lord Krishna fortifies him with his transcendental internal potency. And this overbearing power of the Lord's spiritual potency weakens Maya's influence on the living entity. So in other words, Krishna builds a fort around the jiva and protects him from Maya. You know? Just as response to our sincere calling out. You know? So it's a whole internal thing, this Krishna consciousness. You know? And, you know, we also, I think it's Chaitanya Charitamrita where it says, you know, if we call out, from this day on I am yours, you know, then also Krishna immediately, you know, protects that living being. And, and, and from this day on I am yours. Nice meditation, you know. Prabhupada, from this day on I am yours. Gurumaj, from this day on I am yours, you know. Nice meditation we can have again and again, you know. Yeah, so that's how it works, you know. Very, in a very mysterious way, Krishna's whole big com computer game maze he's, he's created here, you know. So. <laughs> okay, time is up. Anybody has some question? We'll start with the ladies. Yes.
<laughs> yeah, it, it, it often happens, you know, that, I mean, that usually, I dare say, that situation is more that we maybe are not materially exhausted as such, but we are just in distress, you know. And then we turn to Krishna for, uh, in this distress. So, and then Krishna helps a bit, and we uh, take up Krishna consciousness, and oh, the distress goes away, you know. And then Maya comes in again because we are actually not materially exhausted. We are only distressed, you know. So that's the difference, whether we are distressed. But we still have our hopes in the heart to make it really big in this material world. But now we are distressed, okay. I mean, this is one of the most common uh, reasons for people to turn towards any religion. You know, Prabhupada was often saying, in war times, the churches are full, everybody runs to the church, prays. So, and then after the war, oh yeah, okay, so now it's over, no need to pray anymore, you know. So, yeah, that's a common thing, so then people are not actually materially exhausted, you know. Yes. What other question did we have? We are still attached. Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you don't like that one, do you? <laughs> No, see. Like, like <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you, but hearing <laughs> is the main and foremost process, you know. When we hear, I mean, just this row of verses, it's some, some of my favorite verses, which I often use in classes, you know, describing so nicely the whole jour internal journey of the conditioned soul, you know. And how Krishna responds if we just sincerely cry out. You know, we have to hear these things, you know, and then think, oh, wow, okay. So, and if I'm not ready to fully cry out to Krishna, then I can cry about that, that I can't cry at, you know, and that something still holds me back and, 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 you know, but, but yeah, there is no other way really except hearing, you know. And that's why Rupa Goswami says, so that's the medicine, even if it's bitter in the beginning, too bad, you know. So if we are sick, we have to take the medicine, even if it's not so dicey, you're just going to have to take it. And you, you have that conviction and hope and, and faith that this is going to help you, and then gradually we will get the taste for hearing, and then we can't stop hearing, as we said the other day. Rupa Goswami was praying to have millions of ears, not only one set, but millions and millions of tongues to glorify the Lord. You know? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we, we've spent so many lifetimes in forgetfulness of Krishna, so what do we think that just in a few short years this is all over or something? You know, no, it requires a whole deep paradigm shift. And I mean, that's why association is so important. You know, without association, we are lost. I mean, now I'm working on my next book, Family Life as an Ashram Secrets of Success. To mold one's family life into an ashram, not such a cheap thing. Many devotees' family life is not an ashram. You know, there's mundane family life here, there's family life as an ashram there, there's a whole mixture in between, 
you know, so uh, it's a whole big uh, spectrum there, you know. And many of us being surrounded by mundane family life, you know, with all its material considerations and so on, we are quite on that side here, you know. And that's why Grihas Ashram is often, it seems like it's not a suitable arrangement for progress. No, Grihas Ashram is a perfect arrangement for spiritual progress. But the problem is we haven't um, received enough training and education. What actually makes family life isn't to an ashram. You know, that's the issue. Most of our childs, they were all grihasas, but their they family life was an ashram. You know? Yes. So it's a whole big topic, you know. So that's why living close to a temple, I usually recommend walking distance. Yes. And I guess a few people are here in walking distance, you know, so then you can come. Then it's very natural that at least once a day, even if you just take darshan of Radha Gopinath, this already uplifts the consciousness immensely, just walking and taking darshan, taking chanameter, even if you don't have time to hear and chant, but just that uplifts the consciousness, you know. But if you live miles away, oh, well, then you just don't have the time, you know. Yes. So, yeah, whole big topic, you know. So many little details there in order to really, um, yeah, accept the whole process wholesomely, you know. Last question, anybody here had a hand up? Yes. <laughs> I think they don't contradict each other. I mean, Prabhupada says this and the Shastra says this also again and again that being in the material world is like a bad dream. You know? Because it's an illusory reality. Like in a dream, it's also a certain kind of reality. People experience intense emotions in a dream. You know, they laugh, cry, some even walk around in a dream. You know, or you're very fearful. You know, and then you wake up, oh, thank God it was just a dream. You know? So, because whole life in the material world, is an illusory reality because at the time of death it's all gone. It's all gone. The only thing we are allowed to keep is my relationship with Krishna, nothing else. Nothing else. You know? Nothing else counts. Whether you a man or woman or German or Indian or you have you have a big house or a small house, you know, it's all insignificant. It's all the show is over. You know, nonsensical stage performance, or like a dream. You know, so yes, it, that that analogy is there in so many places in the Bhagavatam. You know, but the soul obviously leaves the spiritual world because I mean we are here in this body in cage. So how can we say, oh, we never left the spiritual world or something? No, no. You know, we, we are trapped here in the body, you know. So obviously we have left. But then Prabhupada in one bird body also says, actually there is no material world. There is only forgetfulness of Krishna. And from those living entities who are in forgetfulness of Krishna, from them it is to be said that they are in the material world. You know? So, but that doesn't mean that we are not here. It simply means it's a question of consciousness. You know? So, as we talked on Sunday about how the, the, the festivals are a glimpse into the spiritual world. So if we absorb ourselves in that reality and we just 
Ach, we are completely immersed in serving Radha Gopinath and Sri Sri Gonatai and Jagannath Baladev Subhadra and make all these amazing um, arrangements for them and so on. Then we are already in the spiritual world, non-different. Same activities we do there on the altar we, we may be doing in the spiritual world. You know, no difference. Here the ladies are making garlands. There the gopis also make all of so many more things than garlands. You know, garlands is just the basic, basic stuff. <laughs> you know, but then the spiritual world, they make all kinds of decorations out of flowers and bedsteads and carpets and slippers for the Lord, all out of flowers. You know, so that's the real thing there, you know. So, but if we are absorbed here already, you know, in making or be reading all these nice descriptions from the Bhagavatam, the 10th Kento, and, and, and so then we can already live in that reali reality while we are here in North Sydney, 180 Falcon Street. <laughs> you know? So, and then we are already in the spirit world. You know? But the soul is here, encaged in this material body. <laughs> That's it. But it is like a bad dream. So let's hope. For all of us, this bad dream is over soon. <laughs> Would be good. Okay, thank you so much for your kind attention. Shilapopada ki, samarit bhaktavanda ki, gora premanandi, ali ali wala, ali krishna.